my blind and bold prediction is this film will be amazing, but it will not get nominated for Best Picture. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure most of us are still recovering over the Oscars that took place a few weeks ago, but I'm sure many of us have actually already started looking at this next year, seeing what films are going to be nominated. Who's gonna win next year's Best Actor, Best Director, Best Actress? Well, I went ahead and took a look at this year's slate of films, and today, I'm gonna be choosing what films I think will crack next year's Best Picture lineup, and I'm gonna give you some of my bold, blind predictions of what I think might happen at next year's Oscars. But first, I wanted to quickly, just quickly touch base and give you an update about the Oscar stat stack. As many of you already know, based off the results of this year's stat stack, I went out on a limb and predicted Power of the Dog to win Best Picture, but we all know what the end result ended up being. And oh, the yeah. Oscar goes to... Okay, Coda. <laughs> So yes, the stat-breaking coda did end up taking home Best Picture, which left many of you asking the question, well, now what? And that's a really good question. Are stats moving forward something that we can really trust? And I think the answer to that question is what it's always been. You know, stats are never to be fully trusted. But to me personally, stats are always something that one should consider. And I think it's important to remember that while the stats were not entirely accurate in predicting Best Picture this year, stats were still incredibly helpful and reliable in predicting nearly every other single category. I know I personally predicted 21 out of 23 categories and I used a lot of stats in choosing my picks. I wanna say nearly almost every category, almost without fail, aligned with the winner that had pretty much the highest statistical chance. So to me, the stats are alive and well. So in terms of the stat stack, you know, I just wanna thank all my fellow stat stackers out there who are encouraging me to continue the quest and cracking that code. And with the help and suggestions from all of you out there, I'll be sure to revise that stat stack and hopefully bring it back this year better than ever. Together, with your help, I'm sure that we will crack the best picture code. But first, let me get you excited about all the movies we have coming out this year. I'm gonna go ahead and sort through all these excellent looking movies and sight unseen, I'm gonna rank which films I think will be the 10 films nominated for best picture. And along the way, I will also be giving some really bold, specific predictions. And near the end of the year, we're gonna see which one of these bold predictions ended up being correct and which ones ended up being dead wrong. It's always fun to see how dead wrong I ended up being. Okay, cool, so let's get started. Starting with our first film, we have the man, the myth, the legend. Martin Scorsese he has a new film coming out in November. Nice prime spot for awards. Killer of the Flower Moon. This one is written by Eric Roth, who's been nominated many times. I think it's likely that we're gonna see him nominated for Adapted Screenplay. It's starring Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, Jesse Plemons, and Lily Gladstone. So this is actually based off a 2017 nonfiction book, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders, and The Birth of the FBI, which is about a series of 1920s Oklahoma murders and the Osage Nation committed after oil was discovered on tribal land. Obviously, it's a crime drama, Western thriller. Uh, it's gonna be distributed by Paramount Pictures and Apple TV, which by the way, Coda just won Best Picture. Uh, so, and they were also distributed by Apple TV. So, you know, Apple TV was the first streaming platform to win Best Picture. So I'm sure they're hungry to win again. So I believe the film has a reported right now $200 million budget so you know they're gonna campaign that movie. Scorsese's working again with cinematographer Rodrigo Prieto, uh, who also shot Scorsese's Silence in Irishman, in which he was nominated for. So we could see another uh, cinematography nomination there. We have Scorsese's longtime editor, Thelma Schoonmaker, attached to edit. So this film is clearly a big Oscar player. For some reason, I feel like this is one I would be kind of shocked to not see it get nominated for Best Picture. I mean, Scorsese has had films not be nominated for Best Picture, Silence most recently, but for some reason, this feels like it has the talent behind it to really you know, push it 
in the top three. So I'm going to go ahead and put Killers of the Flower Moon, I'm going to put it pretty high up there. For right now, let's put it at number two because this is a, a big one and we'll see how it moves. It might shift. Okay, but let me give you my bold prediction of what I think for Killers of the Flower Moon. My blind bold prediction for Killers of the Flower Moon is I think this film will have a very similar Oscar journey to True Grit or a film like Irishman. I'm seeing a lot of nominations for this film. I'm seeing adapted screenplay. I'm seeing best director, best picture nomination, some acting nominations, cinematography, costume design, production design, bunch of nominations, but I'm predicting it will not win best picture and it will only win one award, if not go home empty handed. I hope I'm wrong because I'm a big Martin Scorsese fan, but I think Marty is the type of guy to always make films that they admire, but not one that the preferential ballot is friendly to. Personally, I can't wait to see it, but that is my big, bold, blind prediction. All right, well, the next film to talk about, we have She Said, directed by Maria Schrader, written by Rebecca Lankiewicz. It's starring Zoe Kazan, and it's got Carrie Mulligan, Patricia Clarkson, uh, this is going to be a drama that's based on the 2019 book of the same name, She Said, where journalists from the New York Times expose Harvey Weinstein's history of abuse and sexual misconduct against women. So this is going to also be released in November, I believe November 18th. This is going to be distributed by Universal Pictures. So big studio behind this one. It's got Brad Pitt listed as a producer who also was the producer, by the way, of 12 Years a Slave, Moneyball, and The Big Short. So uh, big producer there. So the one thing against it is Maria Schrader doesn't quite have an Oscar history, but she's an up-and-comer, a very talented up-and-comer, and this could be her introduction into the Oscars. So the one aspect I think Universal needs to campaign is female director, female writer, female cinematographer. She said, I could see being a player, it's got Carrie Mulligan in it, who recently came off of Promising Young Woman. So she said could potentially get in. It's obviously very relevant subject matter, happened only a few years ago. Um, and also maybe this could be this year's spotlight. So I'm for now going to put, she said, I think there's probably a lot more films that are gonna be coming out. So right now, let me put it at number five. Moving on to our next one, we got Empire of the Light. This one is directed by Sam Mendes. It's written by Sam Mendes. It's starring Olivia Coleman, Colin Firth, Toby Jones. So this one we don't know a lot about and we're not gonna probably know a lot about a lot of these films. But this one, what we do know and what we are hearing is that it's a British romance love story that takes place in an English coastal cinema during the 1980s. So the release date hasn't been announced. It's distributed by Searchlight Pictures shot by Roger Deakins, nominated 15 times, won two times recently with uh, Blade Runner 2049 and 1917. It's edited by Lee Smith, who was the same editor of 1917, nominated three times before. Uh, one of those was for Dunkirk. Sam Mendes is the sole writer, has never been the sole writer for any of his films. So maybe that's something that could work for it or against it. Uh, the music's by Thomas Newman. And Thomas Newman, obviously a popular, popular composer. Sam Mendes has been nominated for directing, as we know, twice before, 1917 and American Beauty. So I think the pros we have going for this film is there's a lot of talent behind and in front of the, ca the camera. A lot of people who have been nominated multiple times. So I think I feel pretty confident. I mean, this could be a smaller movie for Sam Mendes. It could be just a very tiny project. But that being said, you know, we know Sam Mendes has been nominated twice before American Beauty in 1917. And this sounds pretty Oscar baity. Don't know the size and scope of the film, but with that being said, I think I can feel confident putting Empire of the Light. I would even say, I would rank it above She Said, actually. So I'm putting Empire of the Light at number four. All right, the next film, we have the highly anticipated Babylon by La La Land directors. Damien Chazelle. It's written by Damien Chazelle. It's starring Brad Pitt, 
Margot Robbie, Tove Maguire. Uh, the plot is currently unknown, but it's being described as a drama set during that transitional period for Hollywood from silent films to talkies. It's going to be released on Christmas, I believe. It's distributed by Paramount Pictures, which is the studio of Wolf of Wall Street, The Fighter, and True Grit. I will say, though, not a lot of Best Picture nominations have come from Paramount Pictures the last few years, but you never know. Obviously, it's Damien Chazelle, so it's going to be probably a big player. I'm hearing rumors that the early cut of this film is actually three hours long, and the early screenings, uh, the perception from that have been over the roof, passionate about this. People are calling it a masterpiece. They're comparing it to Wolf of Wall Street, Federico Fellini, Satyricon. So a lot of interesting things coming from those early screenings. It's a La La Land reunion, it appears. The same DP, composer, and editor of La La Land, shot by Linus Sandgren. It's got the music by Justin Hurwitz, which won him his Oscar for La La Land, edited by Tom Cross, which we know he won for Whiplash. So the pros of this film, I think, are obvious. It's got massive, massive talent and a lot of people involved in this film who are high caliber uh, Oscar contenders usually. The cons, I would say, is that the Academy does have a history of being kind to films about Hollywood, but I do think the Academy, as of late, are becoming a little bit aware of not awarding films about Hollywood, kind of like not awarding it the big one. So here's my bold prediction for Babylon. My blind, bold prediction for Babylon is I think this film will rack up many nominations. I think it'll be very similar to Mank or Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm thinking about nine to 10 nominations. I think it will win cinematography and production design. I think most of us will love it, but for some reason, it will be a film that the Academy voters don't appreciate and respect as much as we do. And for that reason, they will not award it Best Picture. All right, but Babylon is gonna be a big player. So I'm gonna put it at number two and I'm gonna move Killer of the Flower Moon down. So I'm putting Babylon at number two, moving Killer of the Flower Moon down. Okay, let's talk about our next one. This one comes from Ron Howard. This one's called 13 Lives. It's written by William Nicholson. It's starring Viggo Morganson, Colin Farrell, Joel Edgerton. It's uh, the documentary. If you've seen the documentary, The Rescue, this is the live action version of that film. It's a survival drama film about the real life events of the 2018 Tom Lang cave rescue that saw a junior football team and their coach trapped in a cave for a period of 18 days. So this one, there are early rumors that the studio has been saying that this has been screening through the roof. The audiences apparently love it. It's being released on November 18th, I believe is the scheduled date. It's been distributed by United Artists and Universal Pictures. So a lot of power behind the film and obviously they're releasing it at a time that is the award season time. So that's some pros going for it. Some other pros, the writer has been nominated twice before for Gladiator and Shadowlands. So cons might be Ron Howard himself. He kind of has a history with the Oscars that's a bit spotty. He won Best Director in 2001 for A Beautiful Mind. His last seven films though, have not been nominated for Best Picture. And his last film, Hillbilly, LG, you know, well, we all know what happened there. So Ron Howard is not entirely reliable uh, in terms of, I think, predicting his films always. But because this film has had some early word of it being very positive, I'm going to go ahead and put it on my list. But I'm going to put it down at number seven for now. Let's put it at number seven and see where it ranks. All right, next film on the list, we have Women Talking. This one is directed by Sarah Pauly. It's written by Sarah Pauly. It's starring Frances McDormand, Ben Winshaw, Rooney Mara, Claire Foy, Jesse Buckley. So this one is based on the 2018 novel of the same name. It's about a group of women in an isolated religious colony in Bolivia as they struggle to reconcile their faith with a string of sexual assaults committed by the men in the colony. So this one has a release date that's a bit unknown at the moment, but it is expected to be released this year. It's distributed by United Artists. So the director of this film, obviously the director from Away From Her, Take This Waltz, Story We Tell, 
Uh, she was nominated once for Away From Her uh, in the Adapted Screenplay category. So she kind of has that writer-director reputation. Sarah Pauly hasn't made a narrative feature film in about a decade. So this could be a project that she's been stewing over for years. So that might be a con or pro, uh, depending on how you see it. Uh, it was shot and edited by people who haven't been nominated for an Oscar before, but it does have Brad Pitt listed as a producer. The music is by Hildor Gonadir. My name is Hildur Gunnadottir. Which I will never be able to say that name right, who recently won for Joker. And also the story to me just sounds like something that could be a player. It could be a complete small indie film, but if done right, I think this could be this year's Power of the Dog. It could be this year's No Man Land. I think this just has a story that I think will resonate with the Academy. It's got feminist themes. I'm gonna rank this one higher. I'm gonna put it under Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm gonna put it right there, that spot at number four. Okay, next film on the list, we have Poor Things. This is directed by Yorgos Lanthimos. It's written by Tony McNamara. It's starring Emma Stone, Mark Ruffalo, William Dafoe. So this film is being described currently as this Victorian tale of a young woman who is brought back to life by an eccentric scientist when her brain is replaced with the brain of her unborn child. And it's a sci-fi kind of comedy romance. So this one, there is no current release date set right now, but it is listed to come out this year. It's being distributed by Searchlight Pictures who recently won with No Man Land. So Tony McNamara is the writer who recently was nominated for Yorgos's uh, The Favorite. So this one could be a big player. When it comes to strange, when it comes to bizarre, you know, if I had read this plot from another director, I probably wouldn't predict it. But Yorgos, I just have faith in when it comes to handling odd material. I love what he did with The Favorite. I think the Academy loved what he did with The Favorite and I think he's on their radar, and I think they'll take his strange premises and see the artistic value in it. So I'm gonna go ahead and put Poor Things on the list. I'm gonna actually put it above Empire of the Light. So I'm gonna bring all these films down, and I'm gonna put Poor Things at the number five spot. Yeah. I'm actually very excited for Poor Things. I don't know why it sounds very intriguing to me, and I actually have a bold prediction I'm gonna make a bold prediction for Poor Things. Okay, my bold blind prediction is I think this will get at least two to three acting nominations for the actors in the film. And I think the film will finally get William Dafoe his first well-deserved Oscar playing an eccentric scientist. It's the perfect role for him. All right, so the next film we have, Rustin. This is directed by George C. Wolf, the director of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. This one is written by Milk writer Dustin Lance Black and George C. Wolf. It's starring Coleman Domingo, uh, Chris Rock, Andre McDonald, Jeffrey Wright. This is a drama about a gay civil rights activist, Banyard Rustin, who organized the 1963 March on Washington. Right now, it doesn't have an official date, but it is expected to come out this year. This is being distributed once again by Netflix. So I think this film has a lot of promise. It's shot by Tobias Schleser, who was the same DP as Ma Rainey, but he's never been nominated before, I don't think. Uh, it's edited by the same editor as Ma Rainey, so it's a little bit of a Ma Rainey Black Bottom reunion. Uh, the pros for this film, Coleman Domingo, has been an actor people are starting to recognize more and more. Recently, you saw him in Zola, If Bill Streets Can Talk, and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom as well. So he is an up and comer, one to keep your eye out for sure. I think he will actually kill it in this role. So I can see this movie doing really well. So the cons behind it is, you know, this is the same director of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and that was recently, you know, expected to hit Best Picture but it did miss a few years ago. So, you know, that had the star power of Chadwick Boseman and Viola Davis behind it. So I could see this missing, but I do see Coleman Domingo as being someone who's gonna kill it in this role. So if he kills it and he's a big actor front runner, I think Best Picture will just kind of swoop in with them. So here's my bold prediction for Rustin. Domingo 
will score his first Oscar nomination in this role. However, the film will not be nominated for Best Picture. All right, so I'm gonna put Rustin at number 12. Let's put it at number 12. All right, our next movie we have White Noise. This is directed by Marriage Story director Noah Baumbach. He's also writing it as well. It's starring Adam Driver, Greta Gerwig, Don Cheadle. So I've read the log line for this one. This one says it's a drama based on the 1985 novel of the same name. It's a family's attempt to deal with the mundane conflicts of day-to-day -day life while grappling with the larger philosophical issues of love, death, and the possibility of unhappiness in an un certain world. Right now, the release date is unknown. It's being distributed by Netflix. I hear it has a very big budget and it's kind of a drama, mystery, philosophical sounding movie. Kind of sounds like the last 30 minutes of Don't Look Up as a feature. I don't know a ton about the novel, but it sounds pretty highbrow. So this is going to be Noah Baumbach's first film not based on an original story. He's been nominated before twice for original screenplay, so they do like him. Uh, but this is going to be an adapted screenplay. It's shot by the DP who recently shot Humans. Hasn't been nominated before. It's edited by Matthew Hunnam, who edited Swiss Army Man and Wildlife. So I don't know. For this one, I could see this one kind of going either way. It sounds like a pretty high concept. Um, I know it's got a pretty sizable budget. So this one, I, I honestly can see kind of missing out. But I also could see it getting in. Um, I, I really do not know. Um... For me, my instincts are telling me that it's it's not going to get in. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I, I'm probably wrong. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and put White Noise not in the top 10. I'm going to put it lower. I'm going to put it under Rustin. So moving on to our next one. I'm not sure if this is the title, the official title, but this is Canterbury Glass. This is the David O. Russell film coming out. It's written also by David O. Russell. It's starring Christian Bale. Margot Robbie, John David Washington, uh, Rami Malek, Chris Rock, Zoe Sedana, Anya Taylor-Joy, Michael Shannon, Taylor Swift, Mike Myers, Robert De Niro. Oh my gosh, what a cast. That's a huge cast. It's unknown what it's really about right now. It's very under wraps, but so far it's being kind of described as a period comedy about a doctor and a lawyer who form an unlikely partnership, whatever that means. Uh, it's David O. Russell, so it, you kind of know what to expect a bit with David O. Russell. Uh, the release date is currently slated right now for November 4th, uh, 2022, but I'm not sure if that's the official release date. It's being distributed by 20th Century Studios, so a lot of talent also behind the camera as well. This one is shot by Emmanuel Lubezki, nominated eight times, won three of those in the last decade, um, edited by Jay Cassidy. Uh, who's worked with David O. Russell before. He got nominated for Several Lines Playbook. American Hustle definitely knows how to kind of, you know, kind of shape a David O. Russell movie. This one has the music once again by Hildor. Let's see if I can get it right. Go nada tier. My name is Hildur Gunnadottir. Probably got that wrong. Who recently won for The Joker. So this one is jam-packed with all-stars in front and behind the camera. David O. Russell films... You cannot underestimate David Russell films. They do really well, especially with the actors. Uh, and the Academy loves David Russell movies. The three out of the last four films were nominated for Best Picture. The Cons is probably David Russell as well. He doesn't have the cleanest reputation, so I'm not sure how his reputation uh, controversies may impact the movie. But it's so hard to deny the talent of this movie. Um, and even if they don't like David O. Russell, I mean, they're still can't deny all the other talent involved in the movie. So I don't know. I might be ranking it too high, but honestly, I got to throw it in my top 10. I'm going to put it at my number seven spot. So putting Canterbury Glass at my number seven, can't deny David O. Russell as much as you want to. You really can't deny his films always seem to perform well. His last one, Joy, didn't perform incredibly well. But, I mean, I think this 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 cast and this talent behind this thing is stacked. So I got to put it in my top 10. All right, moving on to our next film. This one is the follow-up 
of the Father. This is directed by Florian Zeller, written by Florian Zeller. This one is called The Sun. It's starring Hugh Jackman, Laura Dern, Vanessa Kirby, and Anthony Hopkins. It's about a couple whose life is thrown in disarray when an ex-wife turns up with his teenage son. This has no official date right now, but it is listed to come out this year. It's being distributed by Orange Studio and STX Entertainment. So this is based on a play also written by Florian. Uh, it's actually part of a trilogy of plays, one being the father, this one is the son, the next one is the mother. So we might be seeing a trilogy of all three of these films. Uh, from my understanding, this is not narratively connected or tied to the father at all. So this has the same cinematographer as the father, Ben Smithard, returning to shoot it. So the pros for this film is the director got a heck of a performance out of Anthony Hopkins. So I really do trust his ability to get dynamite performance out of his actors. Um, the father was a big kind of unexpected hit with the Academy. It snagged a best picture nomination, I think surprisingly to most people. So, you know what? I'm gonna give a bold prediction for The Sun. My bold blind prediction for The Sun is I think this will snag a few nominations similar to what Call Me By Your Name or even The Father did. I think this will score nominations in the screenplay. Two or even three acting nominations, a best picture nomination, and I think Florian Seller will get his first directing nomination. So that's my bold prediction for The Sun. I'm a believer in this film. I think it's gonna do well. I'm gonna go ahead and put it at my number five spot. Let's put it at my number five. That's That might be too high. That might be too high. But let's put it at number five for now and then I'll readjust later. All right, the next film we should talk about, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. This is directed by the Daniels, Daniel Kwan and Daniel Shiner. So this film has already come out, it's taking the world by storm. It's a science fiction black comedy film. I haven't seen it yet, I'm dying to see it. I'm gonna actually see it in a few days. From what I understand, this movie is about a woman who learns she has the power to exist in a parallel universe and be able to control objects across them. The film is expanding everywhere, I believe on March 25th. It's distributed by A24. It has an amazing score in reviews right now. 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's got an 82% on Metacritic and an 8.9 out of 10 on IMDb. So people are loving the movie. So some cons against it, the editor and the cinematographer have never been nominated before. Also, maybe a con is that it's released so early that it might be forgotten by the end of the year, but you never know. This could be this year's Get Out and Parasite movie that kind of just is so creative and interesting that it just kind of stays in people's minds the whole year. So I don't really know where to put this film, but for me, because the reviews are so high, I'm gonna bet on the idea that it stays in the conversation the whole year. I think it's gonna be a passion choice. And in a year of 10, I think it might make it. So I'm gonna put it right now at my number nine spot. Moving on to our next film, we have The Killer. This is directed by David Fincher. It's starring Michael Fassbender, Tilda Swinton. What a pair up, that is a beautiful pair up. Uh, it's a neo-noir action thriller based on a French graphic novel series of the same name. It's about an assassin. Uh, right now, there's no official release date. It even could not even come out this year. Maybe it could be pushed to next year. So I'm not really sure whether I should include this on the list. Uh, it's distributed by Netflix. It's an action crime drama thriller. It's the same cinematographer as Mank, who recently won an Oscar. The script is by Andrew Kevin Walker, whose credits include The Wolfman and Sleepy Hollow and Seven. The pros, the casting of Fassbender and Swinton. I think those two will work really well together. And in a Fincher world, that just seems like a match made in heaven. I love the sound of that. The cons, not sure if this is gonna even come out this year. This doesn't sound like maybe it'll be Fincher's kind of Oscar 
type of movie. It, because it's more of a crime movie, it might be more like Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. So I'm not sure it'll have that Oscar prestige. So this might be more of a Hollywood movie. So I'm actually gonna put the killer a little bit lower. I'm gonna put the killer on the like number 18 or something. Yeah. All right, so we just did the killer. Let's do the whale, killer whale. We're doing Darren Aronofsky's The Whale. This is written by Samuel D. Hunter. It's starring Bendon Frazier. Who doesn't love Bendon Frazier? Uh, Sadie Sink and Hung Chow. It's a psychological drama based on the play of the same name. The Whale is about a 600 pound middle-aged teacher named Charlie who tries to reconnect with his 17 year old daughter. There's no official release date right now, but it is expected to come out this year. Uh, the distributor, A24. So this one is shot by the same DP who shot Aronofsky's Black Swan and A Star is Born, which actually earned him Oscar nominations for those. The film is edited by Andrew Weisblum, who has two nominations, one for Black Swan and one for Tick, Tick, Boom, very recent. So the pros for this film is I don't really get Noah vibes. I don't really get mother vibes. I see this more in line with Aronofsky's other work like The Wrestler and Black Swan, which were both, you know, works from Aronofsky that got attention from the Academy. Another pro I see for this film is I do think Aronofsky has the ability to get the most out of his performers. So I could see Ben and Frazier getting nominated and potentially winning for this. So some cons for this is Aronofsky's films have only been nominated, I think one time with Black Swan. So this could be a player more for the best actor category, kind of like how The Wrestler was. Also, um, you know, I do feel like A24 is a bit more miss than hit. They did win with Moonlight recently, but you know, I only have room in my top 10 for one A24 films. I don't know if they can juggle two of them. So I don't know if I can put the whale in my top 10. Mm, I'm gonna put it in my number 15. All right, the next film we have Bardo or False Chronicle of a Handful of Truth. This is directed by Alejandro Gonzalez in Yoritu, written by Alejandro Gonzalez in Yoritu, and his co writer, Nicolas Hiacobone. So the logline for this is being described as a nostalgic comedy about a renowned Mexican journalist and documentary filmmaker who returns to his native country facing his identity, familiar relationships, and folly of his memories as well as the past and the new reality of his country. So this has a release date right now being set for November 18th of this year, right prime spot for awards. So the question is, will the Academy warm up to an Inyoritu film that doesn't have American stars? That's gonna be the one big question. I think it could, but you never know. Shot by the same person who shot Uncut Gems. Uncut Gems. Right. Um, I'm getting very Federico Fellini eight and a half vibes from this movie. I think it could be, you know, very artistic. I just don't know if it will connect with the Academy or it won't. It's really hard to tell without seeing it. But, you know, this seems to be a very passionate project, very high brow. Gosh, this is really tough. Alejandro Gonzalez in your two, two time best director winner. Why wouldn't I put him in the best top 10 films? I don't know, I'm worried. I really don't know where to put this film. I really don't. It could just be a complete miss or maybe they'll just love it. I just don't know. I mean, that the subject matter of the film, the story, I don't know if it's gonna be like very digestible um, in a way that the Academy usually responds to a, a foreign film. If I read this plot from another director, it probably wouldn't even consider putting in the top 10. But because it's Alejandro Gonzalez in Naruto, I feel like I kinda need to put in the top 10. You know what? I'm actually gonna put Bardo at like number 11 for now. Yeah, I'm gonna put it at number 11. All right, guys, we got Avatar 2 coming out. Directed by James Cameron, of course. Starring Sam Worthington, Zoe Saldana, Michelle Yeoh is gonna be in this one. Giovanni Rabinsky and Kate Winslet. So this one is obviously gonna be the sequel to Avatar. It's Jake and Atiri. They have formed a family and are trying to do anything they can to stay together. However, when an old threat returns to finish what they started, they're forced to leave their home and explore different regions of Pandora. This is being released, 
I believe in December, December 16th. It's distributed by 20th Century Studios. It's been about 13 years since the first one was released. Has a reported budget, guys, of $250 million. I don't underestimate James Cameron at all. Uh, the last two narrative films he made, Avatar and Titanic, were huge hits, earned Cameron Best Director nominations. So this is clearly a very highly anticipated film. It's definitely gonna be a spectacle to say the least. I know I should not count out James Cameron, but with that being said, here's my very bold prediction about Avatar 2. Okay, my big blind bold prediction for Avatar 2 is I do not think it will get nominated for Best Picture. It will get nominated for some below the line categories like visual effects, production design, and sound, and it will win visual effects, but no Best Picture nomination. All right, we still have some films left to talk about. I can't believe we have this many films coming out this year. So the next one we have directed by Taika Waititi. It's starring Michael Fassbender, Elizabeth Moss, Will Ornette. So this one was based off of a well-received documentary. It's a Dutch American football coach is tasked with turning an American Samoa national team. It's considered one of the weakest football teams in the world into an elite squad. So this one has no release date. It's been in production for a while now. So it is expected to come out this year. It's distributed by Searchlight Pictures. It has the same DP who shot Minari and Watiti's Hunt for the Wilder People. I'm getting a mix for this film of kind of Moneyball meets Ted Lasso. I think there's gonna be a lot of laughs, a lot of heart, and Taika Waititi's pretty hot. He won a Best Adapted Screenplay Oscar recently. So, oh man, this one, I can just feel like it's gonna be a huge crowd pleaser at, at both film festivals and just with the Academy as well. It's gonna be a nice palate cleanser, I imagine. I'm gonna put it at number 10. Next Goal Wins, I'm putting in my top 10. I, I think it's gonna break through. So I'm putting Next Goal Wins at my number 10. All right, the next one on the list, we have The Banshees of the Inishir. This is directed and written by Martin McDonough. It's got Brandon Gleeson and Colin Farrell in it. It's a drama about a pair of lifelong friends on a remote Irish island who find themselves a kind of an awkward time in the relationship where neither one of them wants to be friends with each other. So this one is going to be released, I believe, in October 21st. It's the Searchlight Pictures, also distributing this one. It's reuniting the cinematographer from Three Billboards, Ben Davis, also the same composer from Three Billboards, Carter Burwell, uh, Mikkel E.G. Nelson, the editor who recently won for The Sound of Metal, is involved in this film. So this film clearly has a lot of talent behind it. I think this could be a film that is a good film. I just don't know if it'll be big enough or grand enough, but it is Martin McDonough. It's Martin McDonough who did so well with Three Billboards, but some of his films don't get in, you know, Seven Psychopaths, you know, that didn't really strike the Academy too much. So right now I'm not gonna put in my top 10. All right, next movie on the list, we have Don't Worry Darling. This is directed by Olivia Wilde, who recently came off of Booksmart. It's written by Katie Silberman, starring Florence Pugh, Harry Styles, Chris Pine. This one is about a 1950s housewife living with her husband in a utopian experimental community as she begins to worry that maybe his glamorous com company may be hiding some disturbing secrets. This one is going to be released in September and it's gonna be distributed by Warner Brother Pictures. It's a thriller, I believe. The cinematographer for this is Matthew Lapatique, who was also gonna be shooting this year's Aronofsky's The Whale. Uh, John Powell is the composer. So this film does have the potential to be this year's Promising Young Woman. But for me, I'm getting kind of vibes that are like uh, more Hollywood, less less Academy, less prestige and more Hollywood, ex you know, exciting. So that could be the path that Olivia Wilde is taking. I don't think I'm gonna be putting this on my top list, but it's definitely one to look out for coming out. But the next one is one that I think is on everybody's list. This one is The Fablemans. It's directed by Steven Spielberg, written by Tony Kushner and Steven Spielberg himself. It's starring Paul Dano, Michelle Williams, Seth Rogen. This is 
Spielberg's Belfast. This is a semi-autobiographical coming of age drama based on Spielberg's childhood growing up in post-war Arizona. So this has a release date of November 23rd of this year. It's being distributed by Universal Pictures. And as we know, last time Universal Studios won Best Picture was in 2018 with Green Book. So this has Michelle Williams cast to play Spielberg's mother. Paul Dano is playing the role of Spielberg's father. And Seth Rogen is playing Spielberg's favorite uncle. Spielberg hasn't had a screenplay credit since AI, artificial intelligence. But he's writing this with Kushner, who has been uh, writing with Spielberg. He wrote West Side Story and Lincoln, Munich, and he's been nominated twice for screenplay. Spielberg, once again, working with longtime composer John Williams and his cinematographer, Janusz Kaminski. Uh, Kaminski has been nominated six times with Spielberg and won two of those times. Um, so the pros for this film. I think that it's a personal story, which could very easily echo Roma and Belfast. The cons being, it could be just potentially a little bit overly sappy and a big bag of who cares, really. But I don't think so, man. I have faith that the Fableman is going to do really well. I think it's going to be a huge Oscar player. Every time Spielberg has a film in uh, the contention, it seems to make it in the best picture. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm putting... Fableman's, should I put it my number one? I think I'm gonna put Fableman's at my number one. All right, moving on to our next film. And these ones, I think we can rip right through. We have Armageddon Time, written and directed by James Gray. It's starring Anne Hathaway, Oscar Isaac, Jeremy Strong, Anthony Hopkins. This one you can say is kind of James Gray version of Belfast. It's a coming of age drama about growing up in Queens in the 1980s. So currently, there's no official date, but it is expected to come out this year. It's distributed by... Focus Features. This is James Gray, director of Lost City of Z, The Immigrant, and Ad Astra. He's never been a big Oscar player and never been nominated for an Academy Award. Of course, this could be his time for a film to get in. But that being said, I don't feel confident enough about this to put it in the top films, but definitely one to keep an eye out for. All right, the next one is Wes Anderson's Asteroid City. This one's starring Margot Robbie, Tom Hanks, Scarlett Johansson, Adrian Brody, Bill Murray, Brian Cranston, Tilda Swinton, Jeff Goldblum, the usual cast with a few extras. Uh, the plot is really unknown at this point, but it's rumored to be a love story set in Europe. But who knows, really? We don't know a lot about it. The release date is unknown, but it's expected to come out in 2022, but we'll see. It's shot by Robert Yeoman, who was recently nominated for Grand Budapest Hotel and also shot The French Dispatch and Moonrise Kingdom. It's edited by Barney Billing, who was nominated for Grand Budapest as well. Music is by his longtime collaborator, Alejandro Desplat, 11 time nominated Alejandro Desplat, who won for the Grand Budapest Hotel. You know, Wes Anderson has only had really one film to crack the best picture lineup, and that was Grand Budapest Hotel. So I don't know where Asteroid City is going to land, but, you know, the French Dispatch didn't do amazingly well. Um, so I don't know where to put this, but I don't think I feel confident enough about uh, Wes Anderson's kind of Oscar history to put it in the top 10. So I'm going to put it kind of somewhere in that second tier. All right, the next one, we have the Green Book director coming back with another one, The Greatest Beer Run Ever. This is starring Zac Efron, Oscar Isaac, Russell Crowe, Bill Murray. It's about a man who's leaving New York in 1967 to bring beer to his childhood buddies in the army while they're fighting in Vietnam. So this is being distributed by Apple TV Plus, and they had a very successful campaign with Coda, so I can imagine they're gonna be pushing this film. The release date, no official date as of now, but it's expected to come out in the fall. Uh, it's got the same editor and cinematographer as Green Book, and it's a drama war film from what I understand. It. But I have an inkling about this film, so this is my bold prediction for the greatest beer run ever. My bold blind prediction for the greatest beer run ever is I think the film will be actually pretty good. However, I do think the critics will put a bit of a dark cloud over the film. I'm gonna guess around a 67% on Rotten Tomatoes. Ultimately, it will not get any Oscar nominations. 
All right, next one on the list, we have Till. This is directed by Shinoi Chiku. This is starring Danielle Deadweiler, an up and comer, very talented up and comer. We have Whoopi Goldberg. This is the real life story of an activist who pursues justice after the 1955 lynching of her 14 year old son, Emmett Till. This is being distributed by United Artists. It's coming out in October. So this is the director of Clemency. It's featuring a very talented up and comer. I can definitely see her breaking the best actress lineup. This is shot and edited by dudes who really haven't been nominated for an Academy before. So I don't know how confident I feel. I feel like this is maybe more of a spirit awards type of film, but you never know. So got to keep your eye on this film. Till might break the top 10 and might surprise us, but for now I do not have it cracking my top 10. All right, the next film we have Cha Cha Real Smooth, directed and written by Cooper Rayef. This is starring Dakota Johnson. It's about a young man who works at a bar mitzvah party. So this film is going to be wider released in June. It already screened at Sundance, uh, where it sold its rights to Apple TV for $15 million. All right, so this one has a team that doesn't really have its feet kind of planted in the Academy circle, but it could be that little engine that could, kind of like how Coda was. So one to think and consider about, but I don't know if it's gonna sustain uh, the whole year to make it to the top 10, but one to consider. All right, the next film we have is Maestro. This is Bradley Cooper's next film. It's written by Bradley Cooper as well with Joss Singer. It's starring Bradley Cooper, starring Carrie Mulligan, Jeremy Strong, Matt Boomer. I don't have this really high on my list because we actually don't know whether this is even gonna be coming out this year. So this film is a Leonard Bernstein biopic that spans his 30 year marriage. So this one, as I mentioned, the date is unknown. It's probably most likely to be pushed in 2023. It's being distributed by Netflix. Uh, but the producers attached to this one, guys, Scorsese, Spielberg, Todd Phillips, Bradley Cooper himself. So a lot of people behind this film. One to look out for. Don't know if it's going to come out, but keep your eye out for the maestro. All right, the next one, we have Ridley Scott's Napoleon. This is starring Joaquin Phoenix and Vanessa Kirby. This is a biopic about Napoleon, the famous French leader's rise to power in his volatile relationship with Empress Josephine. The release date is unknown on this. Perhaps it will come out next year, but we don't know. It could come out this year. It's being distributed by Apple TV+. Plus. They have a ton of stuff this year. Of course, you need to consider it, of course, because it is uh, Ridley Scott who did win with The Gladiator. It's got Joaquin Phoenix. I'm sure the Academy loves him. A very Oscar Beatty, exciting role. That being said, don't think I'll put it in my top 10 because we don't know if it's coming out and also because, you know, House of Gucci and Last Duel just didn't quite make it. And I don't feel entirely confident in Ridley Scott to always break through. Definitely one, I wouldn't be surprised makes it, but I don't have Napoleon in my top 10. So generally I would say these are the major contenders we should keep an eye out for. Just a few quick mentions, Jordan Peele's Nope. That comes out in July, so it might be more of a blockbuster play. Get Out was a masterpiece. This could be another Jordan Peele masterpiece, so you never know. The next film to consider, Todd Field's Tar. This is being scheduled for October 7th. It's starring Kate Blanchett as Lydia Tar, a classical music composer. So this is being distributed by Universal Pictures and directed by Todd Field, who actually hasn't directed a movie since Little Children in 2006. So this could be a little masterpiece he's been working on for years and years. So definitely one to consider. Another film to keep an eye out for, Park Chan-wook's decision to leave. This is a mystery about a detective who falls for a widow after becoming a prime suspect in his latest murder investigation. Currently, it's in post-production, so no set release date. But you know, it's the director of Stoker and Handmaiden. Could be this year's international pick. So, one to keep an eye out for. We also have Alexander Payne's The Holdovers. This is reuniting Paul Giamatti with Alexander Payne for another comedy drama. The script was written by David Hemmingson, a longtime television writer for the most part. I think this is his first feature he's written. This one sounds quite good too. This is called The Good Nurse. This film is about the pursuit and capture of an American serial killer named Charles Colin who murdered as many as 300 patients in his career as a nurse. Keep your eye on that one. It's got Eddie Redmayne and Jessica Chastain in it, recent winners. So definitely could be a big actor play as well as best picture. You never know. 
And if those films weren't enough, we have Luco Guananino's Bones and All, Timothy Chalamet's returning to work with Luca based on a novel that tells the story of a young woman with cannibalistic urges who goes on the run in search of her father. It seems to have a lot of horror elements. And Luca Guadagnino's last film, Suspiria, was kind of overlooked by the Academy. So I don't know if this will make it. But hey, you know, Call Me By Your Name did very well. So you never know. Speaking of horror, we have Ari Asner's Disappointment Boulevard. This stars Joaquin Phoenix being described as a comedy horror spanning decades. It's a portrait of one of the most successful entrepreneurs of all time. I'm not sure if Ari's ever gonna make a film that's gonna really sit well with the Academy or be the Academy's cup of tea, but it does have Joaquin Phoenix in it. Then we have Antoine Fuqua's Emancipation. This one is that project that starred Will Smith about a slave named Peter who escaped from a plantation. It would have been probably in any other year a top contender, but I do think the prospects of Best Picture have probably dropped dramatically following what happened at the Oscars recently. Keep my name out your fucking mouth! I'm pretty sure Apple is not too happy about that after dropping $130 million to distribute it. Um, you know, and also Antoine Fuqua though has never had a Best Picture player really before, so who knows? And on top of that, we have Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. Looks like it can be very grand and big. Could be this year's Bohemian Rhapsody. So those were just some films being released this year. We still have so many other films. Films I don't know about, films that are gonna sneak up on us. So in terms of what my official top 10 is, I don't know how I feel about Fablemans being at the number one spot. I think something else needs to go there. I don't know if I have the full faith that that's gonna take best picture. Um, I think it could be like a Belfast. That can be more like a number two. I'm actually gonna move the movie that sticks out to me for some reason, I don't know why, is Women Talking. I'm gonna put Women Talking at number one. I'm putting Fablemans at number two. Two weeks later. All right, after rearranging some things, these are my official 10 predicted Best Picture nominees. I have number one, Women Talking. Number two, I have The Fablemans. Three, Babylon. Four, Killers of the Flower Moon. Five, The Sun. Six, Poor Things. Seven, Canterbury Glass. Eight, Empire of Light. Nine, Everything Everywhere All at Once. And 10, I have Next Goal Wins. Right outside the 10, I have She Said, Bardo, Rustin, 13 Lives, and White Noise. Now, here are my bold predictions in all the other categories. My predicted best director, I'm bouncing between Spielberg, Damon Chazelle, and Sarah Pauly. But I'm actually gonna go with Damien Chazelle. My best actor, I could see Ben Fraser for The Whale. I could see Hugh Jackman for The Sun, but let's go with Coleman Domingo for Rustin. Best actress, I don't really know who to go for here. I feel like, you know, just coming off Promising Young Woman, I'm gonna go with Carrie Mulligan with She Said. For best supporting actress, ah, maybe Jesse Buckley for Women Talking or Michelle Williams for The Fablemans, but I'm gonna go with Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Moon. For Best Supporting Actor, I said it earlier, let's go with William Defoe, baby. Poor Things, let's go. Best Original Screenplay, maybe Poor Things as well, but I'm actually gonna go with Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. I think that's gonna come back and win Original Screenplay. For Best Adapted Screenplay, since I'm going for Women Talking for Best Picture, I'm gonna match it up with Screenplay. So Women Talking for Adapted Screenplay. Well, there you have it. Those are my bold picks and predictions for the year 2023, but who am I? Anyways, I wanna hear from you all. What are some of your early bold predictions for next year's Oscars? Are there any films that are overlooked? I wanna hear from you guys. I'll be sure to revisit these picks later in the year to see how right or how dead wrong I was. Also, if I see any comments below that got it dead right, I'll be sure to shout them out in a future video. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you like seeing this video and want to see more Oscar and movie related content, feel free to hit the subscribe button. Other than that, until next time, I'll see you at the Oscars. Wait, I have one more final bold prediction. My final bold prediction is you're going to hit the subscribe button down below and I'm going to get a lot of these bold predictions wrong.